All right, I'm pretty sure everyone actually knows what it stands for. Um, who's used NFC? Who's played with it? Okay. Um, so the basic gist of this is that when you start digging in, the further you dig in, the more you find out, the more nuances you find related to what NFC really means, what it, some people think it means. Um, it gets a little crazy. Uh, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about how it's secure, where it's secure, where it's not secure, where it doesn't try to be secure. Um, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of great, exciting talks on the conference circuit right now about, ooh, I broke NFC, yay. Well, you can do the same thing with a QR code in many cases. Um, you know, it's really, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a cute way to get data into, out of mobile devices. Um, it's, got, it's got some really cool applications, um, but I hope nobody is really approaching it and expecting a whole heck of a lot of security um, as, far, as far as that goes. Um, so these are my friends, John and Larry. They were uh, you know, roommates in university, good buddies, early adopters like most of the people in this room, um, always grabbing the new gadget, always playing with the new toy, um, always trying to one-up each other and, and, and have a good time. So one day John get, picks up a uh, Samsung Galaxy Nexus. As he's setting it up, finds that, that great checkbox, either yes or no for NFC. Um, and you know, like most of the people we know, hits the interwebs to figure out what is it? What does it do? Do I want this checkbox on? Do I want it off? You know, is it safe? Is it unsafe? What do I do? Um, so that guy. Um, at the end of the day, if you, if you really do some digging, you find there are three kind of main understandings of what NFC is. Um, first one is, is really any close range wireless communication. Uh, if you look hard enough, you see people talking about Bluetooth as NFC or Wi-Fi if the devices are close enough. That's like, yeah, okay, yeah, near radio field communication, sure, you can, you can kind of get away with calling it that, but that's obviously not what most people are thinking. Um, the next category, ISO 18092, um, most of what people call NFC enabled, NFC capable, and all of NFC falls in, into this bucket. Um, this is kind of the main core spec that makes up most of the uh, high frequency RFID type activities. Uh, you know, we're talking about two loop antennas uh, in near field communicating, you know, induction, magnetic induction. Um, so this entirely encompasses all of NFC, but there are a whole lot of other areas, payment systems, lots of the transit systems, um, you know, hotel, some of the hotel key cards, um, all kind of fall into this bucket, but aren't really NFC. Um, and then finally we get to everything above this, also exchanging what they call NDEF records. Um, so the NFC forum, which was set up to kind of promote and extend and, and advance NFC, the cause of NFC, um, has defined this, this standard, and it's just a re really simple framework for exchanging information. Uh, NDEF, uh, NFC data exchange format, it, I'll, I'll show you in a few minutes, it's, it's really simple. Um, but if you're doing all of these things, you can then go to the NFC forum and get blessed and get an official stamp of approval that yes, this is really an NFC application, hurrah. Um, all kinds of exciting. All right, so NFC forum defines four tag types. Um, Topaz, uh, made by Broadcom, a, or a division of Broadcom called Innovision. Uh, these are really fast, these are really light. Um, they're also really small. Uh, you're usually talking about 256 bytes. Um, you know, good for a URL, maybe a very small V card, not a lot more than that. Um, the NXP Phillips, there's actually two categories. Um, the Type 2 cards um, are commonly referred to as MyFair Classic and MyFair Ultralight. Um, those fit into there. They are also pretty small, um, under a K worth of storage. Uh, they use the MyFair uh, standard. We'll talk, about, we'll talk about the communication standards in a bit. Uh, there is another version. Um, there's, a, there's an imaginary type five um, that uh, includes the 1K tags, um, which in theory include 2K, 4K, and 8K. But um, this is also made by NXP Phillips, and it is a slightly different um, memory structure. Uh, it's also got different authentication structure. Um, NFC Forum didn't, hasn't blessed it. They keep threatening to. Uh, however, Samsung, and I've heard 
as recently as yesterday that Nokia has also started using that as their um, as one of their common tag types. So if you get the Samsung Tactile app and you get the tags that come with it, they're actually 1K tags, um, which means NFC devices out in the field aren't necessarily required to support them. Only devices um, that use that, that are explicitly coded to do so can support these tags. So one thing to be careful of is when you're, if you're going to put NFC in a public environment, you've got to be very careful to select one of the four tag types so that everyone can read it. Um, otherwise, you run into a condition where it's possible you can put a tag out there, your NFC device can read it, your buddy's NFC device can read it, but you know, somebody else can't because it's not actually following the spec. Um, the Type 3 tags made by Sony, they range from, I think, I think you can get them as small as 64K and all the way up to 8K. Um, these are god-awful slow, um, but they've got good crypto, they've got good uh, uh, write protect capability, they've got good security. Um, they're also kind of expensive. Um, there's the MyFair Desfire line. Uh, this is the, the Type 4 tag. Uh, also by NXP Philips, they've got their hand in a lot of this. Um, there are a couple different variants of the Desfire. We'll talk about that later. There's one type that's really good, and the others are, are functionally broken, not really practical yet. Um, but just kind of real quick summarization: if you want to do like a URL, something simple, Type One, Type Two tags are great. If you want to do something that requires some real uh, security, for lack of a better term, you know, if you want to do something, put it out in the public, make it available and expect that no one's going to be easily able to change it, you probably want to do something uh, like a Type 3, Type 4. There's also, if you need something large, large URL, you need to go there. Uh, it's Type 4. Um, so I, I'm sorry for the wall of text. This is kind of how things stack up. And it's, um, I'll be honest that I actually left out a couple layers because they're just confusing and, and not really necessary to explain it. Um, down at the bottom. You've got uh, what they call a wired interface. They have, there's an ISO standard to describe the connection between the radio and the transponder. And for some reason, they wanted to specify that, but nothing else at the low level. Uh, 18003 ISO um, talks about the, the two loop antennas in close proximity. So RFID falls under that, uh, pretty much anything, anything inductive. Uh, so the ISO 092 we talked about already. This is where you know, normal, HID cards or PROX cards um, fall into this category, but they're a different frequency. They're, they're a much lower frequency. Uh, anything NFC uh, is going to be the 13.56 megahertz. It's going to be the, the it's common, just commonly referred to as the high-frequency cards. Um, the antenna can also be a lot smaller. Uh, I've got some examples over here of you know quarter-sized antennas. Um, so I'm going to jump up here to NFC IP2. This layer is really important in, in some of the more advanced apps. If you've got two smart devices talking to each other, they're usually capable of speaking any one of these protocols. Um, so you've got a layer here that they added, well, as well as any a card type. So you've got a layer here added to negotiate between the two devices which combination of protocols you're going to speak. So that we've got this built in here. Over here, we've got LLCP is low-level communication protocol, two devices communicating directly with each other. Um, so if you've seen the uh, Samsung ads, you hold two Samsung phones together and they you know, sh zap a movie or, or something like that. That's usually going to happen in LLCP and um, simple NDEF exchange protocol. Simple. Uh, ISO 15693 is called vicinity cards. Not very common in the wild. They work to about a meter, meter and a half. Um, so much, much longer range. Uh, 14443 is the most common. If you've got a, an NFC or my fair card in your pocket, it's most likely one of those. Um, there are three subclasses. Type A is my fair. Type B is a patent-free version of A. So it's just the same kind of concepts, just, just patent-free. Um, type C, the Sony Felica standard was actually proposed as Type C and rejected. So that's why I've, uh, I threw a star in there. Um, cool. Um, yeah, so we got the four types again, and then that fifth magic fifth type called NXP, uh, or type five, depending on who you talk to. Uh, on top of that, we've got NDEF, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
and endf itself has a number of use cases. Uh, smart poster, URL, vcard, yeah, you can all read that, we'll talk about those in a second. Um, so there are also beyond the, the standardized use cases, there are a couple others I'll, I'll run through real quick in a minute. Um, all right, so John thinks this NFC thing's cool, he's gonna go try it, he goes buys, and goes buys a few tags. Um, the first one he sticks on his coffee table and programs it for um, Wi-Fi handover. The handover app's pretty cool. You program in your Wi-Fi details. So, in, so when your buddies come over, they swipe their phone and poof, they're on your network. You don't have to, you don't have to key in your web key, whatever. Uh, you can also do the same thing with Bluetooth. Um, so the next tag he's gonna install, he's gonna stick it next to the front door. When he comes home, tag his phone and, and, and text his girlfriend. You know, hey, I'm home. Finally, he'll stick one on the, uh, on the shelf in the refrigerator to, to remind himself to pick up milk on the way home. Really simple applications, really kind of the speed that NFC was really intended for. You know, low security requirement, nothing major going on, but it's just kind of convenient, less typing on your phone. You know, that, that's really what you're doing. Um, at the end of the day, a lot of these could also be done with QR codes uh, with the right app. All right, so we've got the use cases. Um, and actually, in most cases, if you look at the tag, phone calls, SMS messages, and a number of others are actually implemented as a URL. Uh, so it's just, it's just nice and easy to parse. Um, Vcard falls under the MIME, and you can actually include any MIME object that will fit on the card. Uh, so if you want to send an image or you know, Excel file, whatever, it, it'll, it'll fit in there. So these are kind of the standard known use cases that most NFC devices can support. There are also non-standard use cases. So Samsung's got an app. Um, there are a couple other apps, uh, third-party apps you can get where you program a tag and say, you know, hey, set the alarm, change the brightness, change the, the ringer volume, whatever. Um, it will write a URL to the tag that will teach the, you know, tell the phone what to do, but it won't necessarily work for devices that don't have that app. Um, so that's, that's kind of another gotcha, is if you're going you're gonna to put a tag in the, in the, in the public field, you've got to be careful to make sure that um, the, the application you're using is using a standard NDEF format that other applications can understand. Um, cover the, the NDEF format here real quick. There are two main components. The message, which is literally just an array of records. Uh, it has no header, no footer. Um, it's just a set of records. Uh, the key thing to note here is mobile devices, as of this moment, only support one NDEF record um, when reading from a static device, so a tag or a, a passive device. Um, however, if you want two active devices to talk to each other, you can exchange as many as you want. Um, so this actually has great implications from security. Um, you know, if I find a tag in the wild, I can't I can, even if it's not write protected, I can add additional apps or additional records after it but the device isn't gonna listen to them. It's only gonna pay attention to the first one. Um, so it's, kinda, it's a little bit harder to, to stuff in something malicious after the fact. Um, so the endf record has a very simple format. Um, whoop, you've got message begin, message end bits. Uh, chunk flags, in case four bytes of payload size isn't enough for you. Uh, if you want a four gig payload, you can chunk it into multiple messages. I'm sorry, records. Um, so if you set the short record bit, you lose three bytes of payload. So you're down, you're limited to 255 bytes. Um, a lot of the tags you see in the wild are actually shorter like that. Uh, you've also got the ID field and ID length. Uh, I haven't actually seen them used. The idea is you'd put a URL or some UUID on the tag so you could tell whether you've seen it before. Uh, there's a bit that you can turn there, off there and pack it in. Uh, most of the tags you see in the wild have the short format. Very, very compressed, very simple. Um, and then you've got the type name field. I'm sorry, type name format. The type name, three bytes, simply tells the application what format to expect the type in. Um, it's either gonna be well-known, which is very simple, U for URL, SP for smart poster, uh, there are a couple others, or it's gonna be a MIME type in, in the vast majority of cases. So I mean, literally just the, the text, text slash plain um, would be a you know, perfect example there. Uh, there are a couple others for, for other applications that you want to get creative and include a URI or your own random string. Um, again, it's a pretty simple format. All right, so our buddy Larry decides to uh, you know, 
not to be outdone, he goes out and picks up a Galaxy S3 and decides to have some fun with John. So what was the buy milk tag in the refrigerator? Um, suggested he should probably go buy Larry more beer. Um, you know, and hey honey, I'm home is, you know, now, now text, now emails John to say, or, I'm sorry, Larry to say, you know, you know come over and eat some of John's food. Um, this brings us to the quite important topic of write protect. Um, right out of the box, all of these tags are read write. Um, you can order tags written, hard coded from the factory that cannot be changed by any currently known method. Um, if you're going to put a tag in the wild, that's definitely the way to do it. Uh, some offers, uh, Topaz among others, offer a one time program feature. Watch out. It's one, each bit can be set to one once. So if I can make your URL on this tag malicious by adding, flipping a couple zeros to one, that's fair game. Um, I'll talk about the key base stuff in a few minutes. Um, don't use it if you can ever, ever help it. Um, that's usually in the MyFair keys, or the MyFair cards. Um, the access bits is actually pretty slick. There's a, there's a structure in some of these cards where you can say, if it's got one or two keys, you can say which key is allowed to read and which key is allowed to write. And it's possible to set it up in such a way that no key is allowed to write. Locking the tag, it's permanent. Uh, and so far, they're actually, it's actually rather reliable unless you bought the card from China. Um, finally, most of the apps you're going to find for a mobile device have a soft write protect option, which might as well be called non-existent. It sets a bit in the text that asks the next app not to write it. I swear it. Uh, I thought it was a joke when I first saw it myself. Um, so if you want to put a tag out in the field and be secure, there are a couple proposed options. One of them's uh, NFC Sec. Uh, it's actually using you know elliptic curve DH and AES, and looks like pretty good, pretty good crypto design, pretty good spec. Um, unfortunately, most of the tags can't handle the processing required. There's there's two way two way negotiation with the DH. You've got to actually have a smart device. Um, on both sides. Uh, some of the Desfire and the Felica tags can do most of this. Um, unfortunately, nobody's using it. Um, I grabbed this a couple weeks ago. Notice the update date. Um, these are the defined crypto configurations for the NFC SEC standard. And right now, the organization that created it in the first place has, is the only one registered. Um, doesn't look like it's heavily used, um, and I haven't actually seen any examples publicly available. Uh, there's another one called NFC SIG. It adds a new record to the NDEF message uh, with a signature. Uh, unfortunately, unless you have an external reliable trust network, um, that signature is going to get huge because you're going to need the entire chain of trust in there, um, which immediately means you're onto a bigger card, uh, possibly too big for most cards. Um, so, again, we don't see this used in the wild very much. Also, those devi the mobile devices that are only going to read the first record are going to ignore the signature anyway. So, this one doesn't get very far. Um, all right, so John's learned his lesson. Um, write protect before he walks away from the tag. Pretty easy. Um, so, I was in the airport and saw this. Um, and one of the things... It took me a couple times passing by it before I realized what was going on. Um, there are actually instructions here that if you unlock your Galaxy, uh, Galaxy S3, turn on NFC, and hold it up to that spot in the poster, um, you'll actually get, in this case, I think it's a free ebook or a free song or something. Um, so, you know, obviously I whipped out my Galaxy Nexus and read the tag instead of um, scanning it, uh, and it you know, points to a URL and whatever. Um, but it's pretty clear from this to me that most people take a little bit, if you walk by the same poster in the airport and saw a QR code, you'd know exactly what to do with it. You know, you'd, know, you'd know there was the QR capability, you know what to do. Um, but that's pretty non-intuitive. Uh, so the NFC forum has come out with this guy, it's called the NMARC, and the idea is when you see this, um, you're supposed to have trained yourself to immediately wave your phone at it. Um, <laughs> not convinced it's a good idea. Um, also, you got to be a little careful. They're a little protective of their, uh, their copyright. I actually had to put a 
warning that this is not actually NFC enabled because they don't want people to get confused with things that should be NFC enabled. At least I don't think, no. Um, <laughs> all right, so I, 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 no point other than I'm interested to see what's going to happen over time as people start to kind of share that this is NFC capable. Um, uh, another thing you, you discover when you start looking at you know, possible malicious activity with tags is, all right, I've put a tag, you know, say, say I'm running a restaurant and I put a tag on the counter with my Facebook like link. Um, what's keeping somebody from coming along, slapping their own tag over it um, to kind of counteract my tag? Um, one of the things there is there's actually a read race going on. When, when a tag, a passive tag, ends up in a field, the first thing it's going to do is emit an anti-collision ID, a you know, pseudo-unique identifier that's going to tell the device all the tags that are in the field. The first device, in the case of most mobile devices, or all mobile devices and most actual reader devices, the first um, anti-collision ID that was received is the only tag it cares about. There could be 37 other tags in the field. It's only going to care about the first one it gets. Um, so I did a little, did a little racing. Um, and this is just the, the order as far as power up, initialize, how fast the tag will get the UID to you. Um, so if I had a, a 1K on the counter and somebody slapped a, des or a topaz on top of it, that topaz is going to win every time. Um, you know, so it's one of the other things you want to consider is how do you... You know, how, how would you keep that safe? How do you keep somebody from slapping a tag over yours or under yours um, and, and possibly exposing your customers or, or users to, to some form of risk? Um, so I put this guy together. Um, the idea is simple. If you put a piece of glass in front of the tag, you can easily see whether something's been stuck on it. And actually, customers can figure that out pretty quickly that, hey, there's something stuck there or there's not. Um, a poster, drawing, whatever you want indicating, you know, hey, scan, wave your phone here, uh, and foil and some kind of blocking, and it actually, uh, it'll actually do the right thing. Uh, do note that not all tags, most tags don't work directly on metal. That's something you need to try. Um, there are tags you can buy for the manufacturing industry that are designed to be slapped right to a piece of metal for shipment. Um, most tags don't, so you need some kind of spacer if you're going to put, uh, put a backstop in there. All right, so, so Larry decides he's gonna go to play with loyalty cards at, at his at his company, his restaurant. Um, so, you know, he comes up with a pretty simple offer: you buy three meals and you get a free starter. Uh, you know, it's easy to do. All the servers have phones; they can they can update everybody's card on the fly. Uh, decides to use my fair one K cards. All good or something. Um, this is when we get to stored value. Uh, the card up there is actually a Sony Felica used in the uh, Japanese subway system um, called Soika. Uh, all indications are the Soika cards and the Felica cards are actually pretty rock solid. Um, there's not a lot of indication that anyone's broken through those yet. Um, and I'd actually expect quite a bit of indication because there's actually stored value right on the card. Uh, they do back it up with a database, but uh, you... Sorry. Um, uh, technically, it's not an NFC app because it's not exchanging NDEF, but it's using, you know, 18092. It's using all the same stuff. Um, talk about Mike here. Uh, the Desfire EV1 series is also known to be good at this time. There are other Desfire series cards that are. Um, one of them is known practically broken, and one of them is theoretically functionally broken, but uh, it takes, I think, $45,000 worth of equipment in seven, seven days to crack it. Um, so depending on how motivated your attacker is, um, if he's going to get an order of mozzarella sticks, that's probably not a big problem. Um, all right, so that's my kit over here. Um, actually, I'll, I'll probably hang out in the uh, hash center if you want to play with or talk, talk NFC. Um, this is all you really need to do quite a bit of NFC uh, hacking and slashing. Um, we've, we've heard a couple mentions of the Proxmark 3. Uh, it's a wonderful tool. You can 
do damn near anything you can do with any other NFC device. Um, the PN532, uh, it's actually a Arduino shield, uh, and you can emulate cards, you can emulate tags, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, I carry a Galaxy Nexus, which has NFC capability. Um, most of the NFC work I do is actually right from this device. Um, you know, cables, and again, it all fits in that small Pelican case that made it through TSA security twice a couple days ago. Um, so it's really easy to move around with this stuff, um, and there's quite a lot you can do. Uh, with that kit alone, you can edit and read and write any of the tags, uh, assuming no good crypto on the Felica or Desfire and no, um, yeah, no good crypto there. Um, in the case of MyFair, you can break the, the crypto extremely fast. I'll show you that later. Um, and you can actually put the antenna of the Proxmark between an NFC exchange and sniff the actual transaction. So depending on which card type you, uh, some of them run encrypted, most of them don't. Um, and again, emulating tags and devices. If you've got a um, 18092 an badge for your office to, to get in the door, uh, it's actually pretty bloody trivial to snarf the UID off that and uh, and clone it with the with the Proxmark. Um, hello? Oh, are you kidding me? There we go. Boop. Okay. Um, so when I encounter a tag in the wild, and you know, being being the NFC guy I am, I'm I'm always kind of keen to scan it. Um, the first thing I do is I love this one, NXP tag info. Uh, it reads the tag and shows you what's on the tag. If you don't bring up one of these apps first, you're going to find out that it's going to, um, the, the OS, if the phone can, will actually act on the tag. So if it's a URL or an email address or something like that, it'll actually do what it can to act on the tag without giving you the opportunity to decide whether you want to do this. Um, so I bring up one of these guys. Uh, you can get you know full hex dumps, or if in the case of NFC, it gives you a full protocol dump of what's there. Um, really, pretty much, like I said, that's why I use my phone probably the most. Um, another fun tool is the uh, Eclipse Editor uh, plugin. You can structure the NFC message um, in kind of you know, the standard Eclipse pull-down structure kind of menu. Uh, it generates a Q QR code. Uh, there's a there's also a web-based version, uh, and there's an app that can scan the QR code, and the next tag that touches it will be written with that tag. Um, so for trying things like fuzzing and, and stuff like that, this is just a really easy way to quickly iterate through a lot of, a lot of combinations. Um, all right. Um, so I've been saying that my fair-based crypto keys are crap. Um, see if I can give you a, kind of an example here. Um, what, three weeks ago, our team was in Tokyo, uh, all 20 of us for a, for a team face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, I check into the hotel, and you should have seen the smile on my face when they handed me a MyFair 1K card. Um, I had my gear with me, scanned it in the, in the elevator on the way up, and sure enough, there was one sector that was encrypted with a key, and the rest were, was filled with zeros. I think I knew where my target was. Got to the room, quick shower, within a 45 minutes of arriving at the hotel, I had the crypto key. Um, so within an hour, I had made a copy of my room key. All right. Good step one, clone the card, easy to do, copy line for line, or byte for byte to the new card, same key, same place, easy. Beep, door opens, game over. Um, so I decided to take it a step further. As the guys rolled in, sitting at the bar with my phone, now that it had the key in it, I could actually just read the card right from the mobile. Um, everyone who would let me, they'd let me then. Um, I'd scan their card. Um, and, and try to figure out what the format was. Turned out to be pretty easy. Um, 945E is just junk. The 5D here is the guest number. If you're not familiar with hotel key systems, um, they have a guest number. And every time you check in a new guest, they increment that number. And the lock will automatically ignore anything before that number. All right. So you know, basically the idea is no matter what other keys out there exist, when they hand the next guest their key, it's gonna, the first time they use it in the lock, it's going to obliterate all the previous keys. Um, we've got a date. 
It's kind of interesting. This is a hex dump, and I checked out on October 13th. <laughs> Gets better. That's a hex dump. That's the time. Checkout was 1 o'clock. It was nice of them to give me half an hour and a second. Then we've got the room ID. Turns out it's a monotonically increasing number. If you walk down the hall, every door is the next number. Um, and finally, I discovered the hard way that the second line, which is mostly empty, included a bit for you're allowed to use the elevator or not. I tried a card with just that bit. Didn't work. Um, so this is written in the one sector that's got a key on it. That's all that's there. The rest of the card is completely blank. All right, so we've got that. I can clone the card. Cool. All right, so we've got somebody in room 13, and their, their, their room ID is, is 30. Um, and if somebody gives me the key, their key, and I find a room ID of 34, you know, I can do some pretty quick math and figure out what room they're in. Turns out I was wrong. I was off by one. The guy came down the next day and told me that the room next to his didn't exist. It was a sitting area. Scratched that out, and poof, if I had actually gone upstairs, I would have found the right room. So, all right, I can clone, and I can tell you your room number from the key. We're getting close. Now for the killer. Um, we're sitting in, the, sitting in the bar with the guy from uh, 1225 and the guy from 1227. The guy from 1226 is sitting right back there. He was upstairs doing email. So 1225 and 1227 gave me their keys, scanned them. That's some pretty easy math, don't you think? Um, so Mr. 1226 was, was upstairs mindlessly typing away on his email, and his manager knocked on the door. And there's, there's a little debate about the exchange here. The guy coming to the door swears he heard come in, so he did. Beep. Done. This is from never seeing his key. Never touched it, never had it. I did have to guess at, guess at the guest ID. And as it turned out, I screwed him later that day because he left my key that I made in the power, button, power slot and went downstairs with his key that is now invalid. So he gets downstairs and he comes back up, won't work, goes down to the desk, they give him a new key. And it turns out, so sector eight is where the, um, where the room key was, all right? And the hotel desk recoded his key and added sector 10 with the key, all zeros. So the theory is this actually resets the guest ID clock. At first we thought it was a master key, but uh, that would have been just too lucky. Um, so yeah, um, so I just upgraded his previous key, so they both had the same guest ID and we're all good. Um, all right, so uh, unfortunately for Larry, he used 1K keys. Um, John was able to reverse engineer it in a heartbeat. Um, now John has his own promotion. Um, purchase one meal at John's restaurant and get a free starter at Larry's. You can just crank these cards out. It's no problem. Um, all right, so one of the other things you'll notice with um, NFC stuff is they've all got the, that anti-collision ID. So when multiple devices show up in the field at, at the same time, the, the device can discern which one it wants to talk to. Um, be very careful here. Uh, on the MyFair series, the manufacturer has already announced they've rolled over keys. So it, don't use the anti-collision code for any form of security. Um, one, it's possible to get another card. Two, it's possible to clone it with a device and just emulate it. And three, it's actually surprisingly easy to call China and get a card that looks and feels exactly like a MyFair but ignores the requirements about not writing over the UID. Um, you know, so the knockoff cards are easy to, easy to get your hands on, easy to clone. You'd be surprised how many businesses use just that UID as the token to get, the, get you in the front door. Um, I won't mention one that's near and dear to my heart. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, all right. So if you're out there in the wild, um, you know, my, my basic rule is if you wouldn't lick the tag, if you don't know where it's been, uh, use an app to scan it. Um, 
you know, find out what's on it before you scan it. I mean, I know, I know the whole idea of NFC is to make it fast and easy to just kind of beep, and you've got whatever it is they're selling, um, unless you know for a fact what they're selling. Uh, I'm not sure I trust it. Um, you know, never trust the 14A keys for anything. Um, the Desfire and the Velkas are, are generally fine right now. Again, never trust the UID for anything. <coughs> and, um, you know, except on, except at this point in the case of the Felic and the Desfire, don't trust, don't trust the cards for stored value um, unless you're talking about French fries and something simple. And apparently I've had too much caffeine because I blew right through. Any questions? Just one small question. Is MyFair the only 40A implementation, or is there any other implementation? Uh, no, uh, Topaz is also A. And yeah, so both of the NXPs are the uh, NXP2, 1, and the NXP type, you know, type 5, are all 14A. But they are not affected by the attacks that uh, affect MyFair, MyFair Classic. Um, the, the Topaz and the Type, the type 1 and type 2s don't have that key structure. They don't claim to be that secure in the first place. So they're not affected because okay. they don't offer it. Thank you. Hey, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, hotel card sector was encrypted. What sort of encryption I, was used? It was protected by a key. Encrypted was the wrong word. That's my bad. Um, so in the MyFair exchange, when you start up, you have to, or in the case of the one case, you have to address the sector and say, I want to authenticate. Here's my key. Um, and if you authenticate correctly, you'll get good data. If you, if you don't, you get bogus, bogus junk. Um, it's th there is a little bit of alleged cryptography going on between them, and that's one of the reasons it's so easy to break. Um, the attack against it is actually a very simple side channel. Um, every I think it's every four or five failed attempts, it sends back a knack with what appears to be random junk. And if you pay enough attention to it and know what the key is, you can kind of work out the pattern. And th and that's how that's how the um, it's called the it's called the nested attack. That's how that works. Um, it does require having one key that you know on the card. Uh, there is another attack that uses similar methods that doesn't require any keys. You don't have to know anything about the card to get, to get one key back. Thanks. Um, what about payment cards, credit cards? I understand that it's also planned to equip those with um, NFC uh, uh, technology. Uh, yeah, it, well, all right. It's not pure NFC. It's not you know trademark NFC because it doesn't you it doesn't exchange NDEF. Um, those are mostly using the Desfire cards, um, and one of the extension options for Desfire is where you can essentially embed a SIM chip in there with all the you know, the crypto standards that come with that. Um, so the idea is it actually generates a unique number every time you read it. Um, so the idea is, you know, based on time and, and everything else, um, in theory, those are hard to duplicate. I mean, yeah, you can get, you can read the number at one point in time, but if you don't use it right away, um, it won't be valid by the time you get there. Um, I, I recently heard about uh, an implementation from I think YubiKey. Yes. That was doing uh, that is that was announcing um, um, a YubiKey token via NFC to be used as a second factor for authentication. Correct. Can you imagine that something like that, after what you said here, can be secure? Um, I've actually played with that implementation a little bit. A, a friend of mine in the audience has one, um, and what I, I haven't gone into great detail, but um, it's actually using type one, and it's 
generating a unique token every time you scan it. Um, so the assumption is there's either some kind of RTC going on in there, or uh, we've tried cloning, you know, try a read and then use that token and haven't been able to successfully get it to work. So um, I also should note that it's not the, um, the NFC is actually or, um, built into the chip. It's not a standard tag. Um, so I, um, from what I've seen, it's a pretty good implementation. I haven't, I haven't actually tried to tear it apart yet, but it's, it's pretty simple where it's a passing a, an opaque token that should only be valid for a certain period of time. Anything else? Oh. All right. 